Please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, and today we'll read verses 38 to 42. Uh, If you've noticed in your bulletin, uh, put the title of the message there. I don't know how many of you have ever read Mad Magazine. I remember as a kid, teenager, I would read Mad Magazine, and there's a character who oftentimes appeared on the very front of the the cover, Alfred E. Newman, and uh, that was kind of his saying, what, me worried? Well, uh, this has nothing to do with Mad Magazine or Alfred E. Newman, Uh, much more encouraging than that. So let's read the story here and find out what the Lord has for us. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Into her house, and she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, "Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me." And Jesus answered and said to her. Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Now, the story starts out with the words, now it happened. This phrase suggests a casual and almost by chance event, something that kind of happens every day, something so normal that is taken for granted. Jesus coming by and he stops at this house. But as we investigate this story, we will learn that nothing happens just by chance. Jesus is in every circumstance of our lives, and he will teach us something in those circumstances if we will pay attention to him. So, are you paying attention to Jesus? Well, let me assure you, he is paying attention to you right now. So Jesus stops by to visit Martha. Now, it's important to note that the house Jesus entered was Martha's house. This tells us something about the situation we kind of need to know. At that time and in the culture, it would have been proper to identify the house by the name of the man that owned it. Well, the fact that the man's name is not mentioned suggests that Martha was the actual owner of the house. The commentator, Albert Barnes, explains for us. He wrote, from this it would seem that Martha was properly the mistress of the house. Possibly she was a widow, and her brother Lazarus and younger sister Mary lived with her. And as she had the care of the household, this will also show why she was so diligently employed about domestic affairs. So, as we read the story, we see that the reception of Jesus into the home is quite cordial. Now, Mary, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus appear several times in the Gospels from which we conclude that they were more than just disciples of Jesus. They had actually become good friends. And it is quite possible that Jesus used Martha's house as his base of operation during the times he ministered in and around Jerusalem. What we do not see in the story is the disciples of Jesus that traveled with him. Now, those disciples were included in that word they that we read in verse 38. So it can be taken for granted that the twelve were with Jesus and were staying in Martha's house. That had to be quite a crowd. How would you like it if 13 people just dropped in to spend a few days in your house. Matthew Henry, another commentator, offers this comment about the situation. 
He wrote, there were those who kindly received Christ into their houses when he was here upon earth. It is called Martha's house for probably she was a widow and was the housekeeper. Though it was expensive to entertain Christ, for he did not come alone, but brought his disciples with him, yet she would not regard the cost of it. So how can we spend what we have better than in Christ's service? Nay, though at this time it was grown dangerous to entertain him specially so near Jerusalem, yet she cared not what hazard she ran for his name's sake. In other words, she loved Jesus so much that she was willing to put out whatever it would take to take care of Jesus and the disciples, even if it would cost her something um, of persecution. Now, one benefit of having Jesus stay at the house was the many opportunities for private teaching. Now, Jesus' public teaching was very revealing of the general needs of salvation and holiness for the masses of people. So we understand that certainly mass evangelism is important in the work of the kingdom of God as it captures the attention of people that would not otherwise hear the gospel. But in the quiet of the home, with only a few close friends, Jesus was able to share the deep things of God's word and God's will for people's lives. This should be the focus of our attention when we come to church services. You see, this is not just a Christian duty. We must come individually to hear from God and to absorb from his word what he has for us personally. Now, this story introduces Mary, whom we have not yet met in the Gospel of Luke until this point. Lazarus is not mentioned in this story, but we know from later events that Lazarus does actually exist. Now, we have no way of knowing if Mary was married. It seems from the story that perhaps she was quite a bit younger than Martha and perhaps lived with her as was suggested by Barnes in his comment that we just read earlier. Verse 39 draws a distinction between Mary and her sister Martha. Something different about these two sisters. The verse says that Mary also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. We gather from this that Jesus had started teaching shortly after he entered the house. And Mary, also along with Martha and the others, were sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to him teach. Matthew Henry continues his comment. He says, It seems our Lord Jesus, as soon as he came into Martha's house, even before entertainment was made for him, addressed himself to his great work of preaching the gospel. He presently took a chair with solemnity, for Mary sat to hear him, which intimates that it was a continued discourse. In other words, what Jesus was having to say took a while, took a long time. But at some point in the lesson, Martha decided to leave the room to prepare a meal for the crowd. Mary, being the other woman in the house, was expected to leave the room to help her. Now that's pretty common in a household. If there's you know, a few women in the house, when it's time to prepare a meal, they're usually the ones that get up and go into the kitchen to fix it, while us guys will sit there in the living room and talk and carry on some more. Well, that's kind of the picture that I see here. You know, Martha was looking at the crowd and she's trying to get Mary's attention to, let's go feed these people. <clears throat> However, Mary was absorbed in what Jesus was teaching. She was listening to him, okay, paying attention. 
Now, we can't know how much time elapsed between verse 39 and verse 40, but soon Martha became distracted from listening by thoughts of what was going to take to feed all these people. She's still there. She's halfway listening to Jesus, but now her mind is working. Well, I've got this in the fridge, and I've got this in the cabinets, and we'll need this, and started thinking this, very distracted by those thoughts. Now, Martha was not less spiritual than Mary. You see, Martha was a practical woman, and while she was listening to Jesus, her mind was working out the plans for what she needed to do. How many ladies in the congregation, as they're listening to the service, their mind kind of wanders back home to the kitchen. What I see some grins. <laughs> What's in the crock pot? Uh, hope it doesn't, you know, the sermon doesn't take too long because I need to get that out and get ready. You know, that's, that's just normal human being, okay? And that's kind of what's going on here. So Martha was really not less the spiritual than, than uh, her sister Mary. She's just being practical. On the other side of that, Mary was not necessarily more spiritual than her sister Martha. Undoubtedly, she knew that Martha would need for her to help with the meal. She knew that. She was experienced in that. She was a lady. She understood the mechanics of what go goes on in a household. But since the responsibility was not really hers, she was able to set it aside and concentrate on what Jesus was saying. So according to what Jesus said in verse 42, Mary made a choice. We all make choices. Mary made a choice to listen to Jesus. Martha also made a choice. She chose to be distracted. Her distraction was not disinterested in what Jesus was saying. In fact, there are two positive factors to this, as Matthew Henry points out for us. I'm going to read a little bit of what he said here. First of all, here was a commendable respect to our Lord Jesus. For we have reason to think it was not for ostentation, but purely to testify her goodwill to him that she made this entertainment. Note, those who truly love Christ will think that well bestowed that is laid out for his honor. In other words, People that love Jesus just want to serve him and to help him. And then second, here was a commendable care of her household affairs. It appears from the respect shown to this family among the Jews that they were persons of some quality and distinction. And yet Martha herself did not think a disparagement to her to lay her hand even to the service of the family when there was the occasion for it. Note, Henry says, it is the duty of those who have the charge of families to look well to the ways of their household. The affection of state and the love of ease make many families neglected. That may be some antiquated English, but I think you understand. So two good points about Martha and what she's doing here. But given the present situation, <clears throat> according to Henry, there are three criticisms that can be said about Martha. Number one, she was for much serving. In other words, her heart was upon it to have a very sumptuous and splendid entertainment. Great plenty, great variety, and great exactness according to the fashion of the place. She was in care concerning much attendance. Note, it does not become the disciples of Christ to affect much serving, to affect varieties, dainties, and superfluities in eating and drinking, 
What need is there of much serving when much less will serve? I translated that into modern American. Keep it simple. Just keep it simple. Second, she was cumbered about it. In other words, she was just distracted with it. Note, whatever cares the providence of God cast upon us, we must not be cumbered with them, nor be disquieted and perplexed by them. Care is good and duty, but cumber is sin and folly. And then the third point of criticism, she was then cumbered about much serving when she should have been with her sister, sitting at Christ's feet to hear his word. Note, worldly business is then a snare to us when it hinders us from serving God and getting good to our souls. <coughs> from verse 40, we can imagine that Martha was sitting in the back of the room listening to Jesus and thinking about preparing dinner. Now, perhaps she had tried to make eye contact with Mary, you know, giving her the signal to get up and go with her into the kitchen. But upon failure to get her attention, Martha now gets up and she approaches Jesus. That prompted a question in my mind. Why did she not go to Mary instead and talk to Mary? But the story says she went and she talked to Jesus. So she was so upset with what she identified as her sister's neglect that she made a scene, interrupting the lesson Jesus was bringing. How upset was Martha at this point? Well, she blamed Jesus. She blamed Jesus for keeping Mary from helping her. She said, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? She's blaming Jesus, right? Furthermore, she commanded Jesus to make her will his will. She said, therefore, tell her to help me. Jesus sitting right there, Mary's right there, tell her to help me. So here we have a picture of the extreme to which worry and anxiety can push us. How often, when our plans and thoughts about things go the wrong way, do we blame God for what happens? You know, that's one of the first stages of the grief process, is to blame God for what happens. Sure, God knows, God understands. And God understands us when we have those hard feelings. But we can't blame God for what happens, naturally speaking. Worry is wrong. Hmm. Everybody under conviction now? Worry is wrong. The dictionary tells us worry means to feel uneasy or anxious, to fret, to torment oneself with or to suffer from disturbing thoughts. Now, worry is not necessarily sin, but is something that most certainly can distract us from Christ and our commitment to him. The words feel and torment in the definition indicate that worry is a selfish thing. When we worry, we're being selfish. And God, through the Holy Spirit, leads us away from selfishness to spirituality, to commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and his will. Well, in worry, something is in my world that I don't know how to handle or what it will cause to happen. That's what causes people to worry, those uncertainties. In thinking about this thing, I am now frustrated or I'm frightened. And I settle into thinking of what is going to happen to me or my world. And because of worry, I forget about God. 
and I concentrate. What can I do to handle this situation? In fact, like Martha, I just might blame God for whatever it is that I am warring over. God, why did you let this happen? We've all had that thought. To worry is human, but it is not good. Let me read a verse from Proverbs that you may not realize is actually in the Bible. Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. It's in the Bible. Anxiety, worry in the heart of man causes depression. If you feel depressed, it is because worry has distracted you from trusting in God. Now, if you watch television, you'll see commercials advertising medications that have been invented to mask the symptoms of depression. And it seems that there are more depressed world in today than ever before. How frequently these medications are advertised on the television, newspapers, magazines. You'll see them several times a day. Well, without meaning to be overly simplistic, the real cure for depression is to actually commit the things causing the anxiety to God. Jesus told Martha that Mary had made a choice, which was the same as telling Martha she had to make a choice. Well, what choices? Ecclesiastes 11, verse 10, the Bible says, Therefore remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh. Or the contemporary English version puts it this way, rid yourself of all worry and pain. See, there's something you have to do. It doesn't just go away by itself. It won't go away because you take a pill or you take a drink or you uh, puff on uh, a reefer or something like that. It says you, Rid yourself of all worry and pain. No one else can do it for you. It is always a choice. And remember that you always have choices. Then Proverbs chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. It says, Do not be afraid of sudden terror, nor of trouble from the wicked when it comes. Listen. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. In those verses, the Bible gives us a strong command. It says, do not be afraid. Boy, that's, that's not an easy command to obey. You know, when things hurt us and scare us, there's a natural tendency to be afraid. But we have a equally strong promise from that very, very same scripture. How can we not be afraid? Because the Lord will be your confidence. You have to understand that God is very real. God is very much aware of your life and your circumstances, what you're feeling. And when those scary thoughts come to you, Believe it or not, he's right there. He will be your confidence. But you have to make the choice. Okay? Make a choice between worry or God's confidence. Which choice appeals to you? And you know, when you are challenged by that, you just have to say, Lord, I'm hurting, I'm confused, I'm worried right now. Help me, Lord, to put this aside and have confidence in you. Now, I'd like to read Ecclesiastes 5.20, again from the contemporary English version. It puts 
the Ephesians, excuse me, Ecclesiastes, I can't say that word today. Ecclesiastes 5.20 in a very positive way. Listen what it says. God will keep you so happy that you won't have time to worry about each day. Yeah. God will keep you so happy that you won't have time to worry about each day. Can you believe this? Can I believe this? Will you let God do this for you? Or will you choose to be absorbed by yourself and the thing that is causing you to worry? You see, the choice is yours. And as you make that choice, you will need to pray. It doesn't go away just through wishful thinking. You need to pray and talk to God who is your confidence. You may need to talk over your situation with spiritual people that can understand and sympathize and maybe give some advice, some encouragement along the way. But God will most certainly help you to commit those worrisome thoughts to him so that he can work out his will in those circumstances where you see no solution. Well, what did Jesus teach about worry? He spoke to, about worry very directly in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. And I'd like to read that in closing, again from the contemporary English version. Jesus says, I tell you not to worry about your life. Don't worry about having something to eat, drink, or wear. Isn't life more than food or clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. They don't plant or harvest. They don't even store grain in barns. Yet your Father in heaven takes care of them. Aren't you worth more than birds? What's the answer to that question? Yes. Can worry make you live longer? Why worry about clothes? Look how the wild flowers grow. They don't work hard to make their clothes. But I tell you that Solomon, with all his wealth, wasn't as well clothed as one of them. God gives such beauty to everything that grows in the fields, even though it is here today and thrown into fire tomorrow. He will surely do even more for you. Why do you have such little faith? Jesus asked. He says, don't worry and ask yourselves, will we have anything to eat? Will we have anything to drink? Will we have clothes to wear? Do you see worry? Don't worry. Only people who don't know God are always worrying about such things. Your Father in heaven knows that you need all of these things. But more than anything else, listen, put God's work first and do what he wants. Then the other things will be yours as well. He concludes his thoughts with this. Don't worry about tomorrow. It will take care of itself. You have enough to worry about today. What? Me worried? Why would I choose to worry when I know that my God knows my situation, knows the things that are causing my mind to be distracted? I need to make a choice not to be distracted to follow those things but to turn to God and say, Lord, my mind, my heart is yours. Help me. Strengthen me. Comfort me. Give me your peace. Amen.